Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians and chapter uh, 15. And we're going to read the first uh, 34 verses of uh, that chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then uh, we're going to sing, and during that song, the children uh, will go out from the service uh, to their classes in the rear hall uh, with Kate and uh, Jeff uh, leading the way. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of all the apostles, uh, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed." Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, uh, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of, to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is, expected, he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptised on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, Why are people baptised on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, 
for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Well, please do turn back with me in your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. As we meet on this uh, Easter Sunday morning, I want us to begin with the question of why is the resurrection so important to Christians? Why is the resurrection so important to Christians? Because we realise, don't we, that uh, for the Christian we don't only gather on Easter Sunday to remember that Jesus was risen from the dead, but we gather every Sunday to remember Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. So why is it so important? Uh, what is it uh, that uh, makes us uh, want, to, want to gather in this way and, and worship Jesus Christ? Uh, well, the answer is simple. The entire Christian faith stands and falls on the truth of Christ's resurrection. The entire Christian faith. Now, this is a claim, isn't it? This is a big claim. The entire Christian faith, all 2,000 years of it, stands or falls on the reality of Christ's resurrection. If Christ is not raised from the dead, then the Christian message is not good news, but an evil lie. If Christ is not risen from the dead, then the Christian church gathering uh, as, as a gather in, in his name are gathering in the name of a dead man. And I would uh, submit to you that that would be the biggest waste of time today. And you may as well go home. If Christ is not risen from the dead, then Christians are wasting their life and are to be pitied. In fact, Paul would say they're to be pitied above all people. Everything the saint lives for, everything the church works for, depends on the claim that Christ is risen from the grave. So this morning, I want you to come with me to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in your Bibles, in 1 Corinthians 15, and the Apostle Paul here makes a defence to those who at the time, you see, it's, it's no new thing to doubt the evidence, to doubt the reality or, or the claim, the gospel claim that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. It's no new thing to doubt it. There were people in the church at Corinth who were saying there is no resurrection. And Paul, in, in, in his letter to the Corinthians, gets to chapter 15, and he is going to give a defense, an argument to say, without a doubt, Christ is risen from the dead. And your life as a believer this morning, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, your life is not in vain, your, life, your faith is not empty, and your hope is certain. And so, uh, let's consider his argument, and we're going to see two things. We're, we're going to start by seeing the confidence of Christ's resurrection, and then we're going to look at the consequences of Christ's resurrection. So the confidence and the consequences. So let, let's begin by looking at the confidence of Christ's resurrection in verses 1 to 11 in 1 Corinthians 15. I don't know if you know the old hymn that says, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Now, it's a lovely sentiment, uh, but, and, and it emphasizes the important truth of the Christian's relationship, the fellowship we enjoy with the risen Lord Jesus Christ from the dead by his indwelling Holy Spirit. But the reality is, there is a greater confidence than what that hymn expresses. We can, it's not only, uh, the, the resurrection is not something that we know only simply because, well, he lives within my heart. There is an, there is a, uh, there is a objective confidence that is given by the scriptures. Uh, 
There is something outside of ourselves that makes us sure Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Our confidence that Christ is risen is is based on witnesses, and external witnesses to the reality that he did not remain in that grave, but he came out of it. The stone was rolled away. Uh, So what are those witnesses? Well, firstly, Paul tells us about the witness of the Scriptures. So verses 1 to 4, the witness of the Scriptures. He begins reminding uh, the, the Christians in Corinth about the gospel he had already preached to them. What is the gospel? Well, it is simply this, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who the Old Testament Scriptures predicted would come into the world, promised would come into the world, has come among us, and he has died for our sins on the cross. He was buried, and he has risen again. And you see, this is something that Paul says was in accordance with everything that was foretold and foreshadowed in the Old Testament, written hundreds of years before Jesus Christ lived among us. Before Jesus was born to Mary, the prophets predicted his sufferings and consequent glory. There would be a number of examples I could turn to this morning. We could go, for example, to Psalm 22, which uh, is a psalm of King David. And he he writes with incredible accuracy about the sufferings of God's king, who would be, uh, who, whose hands and feet would be pierced, who's, uh, who would be surrounded and have his clothes gambled for, who would uh, call out, I thirst, with the, the tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth. He would then go on to, to describe Uh, in the second part of that psalm, Psalm 22, how as he called out for God to deliver him, he would go down to the grave, but God would bring him back up out of the pit. He would bring him out of the lion's mouth and he would would live forever in the congregation of God's people, leading them in praise to God. This psalm, Psalm 22, and you you might might, might want to go and read it later on, it's, it's so much more than David. It writes as though it's David's experience, but we know it's, it's not David's experience. In fact, David begins with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Words that Jesus would himself cry out on the cross. And they were all uh, predicting, they were all looking forward to a time when the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless saviour, would lay down his life on Calvary's mountain, where he would hang on a cross pierced for our transgressions. And that brings me to another example. Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. You'll you, you want to go home and read Isaiah 53 at the end of the morning. Because 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ was born to the Virgin Mary, uh, we, we read there about the sufferings of the servant of God who was anticipated to come into the world. And we read, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. You see, Isaiah looked ahead and predicted the sufferings of God's servant, of Jesus Christ. He predicted his sufferings, how he would be rejected by men, how he would be crushed for our sins, how he would be a despised and and God would be pleased to crush him that's that's the cross but he would also speak about how God would prolong his days how he would see uh, the accomplishment that he has made as the nations would come and believe on him and be saved and and how he would share share his tomb uh, share the grave with with the wicked he would go and he would be put in a a tomb that wasn't his own, but borrowed from a man called Joseph of Arimathea. The scriptures predicted it. They looked forward to it. They (laughs) predicted that he would die for our sins, that he would be buried, and on the third day he would rise from the dead. God spoke. God promised this would happen. 
And the, the Scriptures are our first witness as they look forward. Now, there's no other book in the world that does that, that looks forward with such precise detail about someone who would come into the world to be a saviour. But only God could do that. There's the witness of the Scriptures. But then uh, Paul tells us about the witness of the disciples, because yes, the Scriptures looked forward. They predicted with great accuracy how Jesus would die and be buried and would rise again. But the disciples looked backwards, because they were there. This just should thrill us. It should give us such confidence uh, this morning that Paul says that uh, Jesus appeared. Who did he appear to? This is verses 5 to 8. Who did he appear to? He appeared to Cephas. Well, who's that? That's Peter. Peter. In fact, uh, Paul leaves out that the women saw him first, and it was the women who were at the tomb, and it was the women who ran to Peter, Cephas, and said, the Lord is risen. And then Peter ran to see the tomb empty and the grave clothes folded. And, and he, he saw it for himself, and Jesus didn't just stop with Peter. Uh, that would have been enough, by the way. The women seeing him, uh, G, uh, Peter seeing him, and then to the twelve, then to the disciples, apart from Judas. Uh, the, 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 the disciples there, even, even the one who doubted, Thomas, who said, I wouldn't believe this, I'm not going to believe this unless I see him with my own eyes, unless I touch the place where he was... Uh, uh, where his wounds were, on, on, his, on his hands and on his side. And then Jesus appears to him and Thomas falls down and says, my Lord and my God. He's, he's doubting Thomas. Believed. How about you? Have you believed? And, and then, then I, I find this astonishing. Then uh, to more than 500 brothers... At one time, verse 6, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now look, if Paul, I, I, I think that is a audacious claim to make, and it is more audacious if it is, if it is not true. You see, uh, if you're trying to make an argument, and you're trying to get people to believe an event happened that didn't happen you might say, well, 500 people saw him and they're all, they're all dead. You can't speak to them. But he doesn't do that. He says more than 500 brothers, he appeared to more than 500 brothers, some of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. What's he saying there to, to, the, the, to the audience his letter was first written to? He's like, go and check it out for yourself. You want their address? I'll give it to you. You want to go and speak to them? I'll, I'll, I'll point you, point you to, in the direction of, of some. There were eyewitnesses, real eyewitnesses, who saw Jesus risen from the dead. And then the, the last witness is the witness of the last apostle, Paul, the apostle Paul. Uh, look there at verses 9 to 11. In fact, verse 8, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Not only the friends of Jesus saw him risen from the dead, but an enemy of Jesus saw him risen from the dead. You see, you go, well, it's all very well that, that his, his, his buddies saw him and they, they claim to have seen him. But what do you do with someone who was an enemy of Christianity? To someone who participated in the death of the first Christian martyr in 2,000 years of Christian history. What do you do with that? There he was, Stephen, this man Stephen, a deacon in the church who had been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus was, had died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And uh, the, the, the people drag him out of the city and they begin to throw stones at him because they are so offended by his gospel. And who is there standing, holding the coats, consenting to the entire thing? The Pharisee, the religious leader of Jerusalem, Saul of Tarsus, who would later become known as the Apostle Paul. 
And, and, he, and, and not only did he do that, but he went to the, the officials and he got letters and he began arresting Christians, dragging women and children out of their homes, putting them in prison, hoping that if they were Christian, they would be put to death because he wanted Christianity to be done with. He did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, was the Savior. He, he, he refused him and rejected him. We don't know what Paul saw of Jesus' ministry. He must have seen something. He must have been uh, uh, among some of those Pharisees who plotted to put Jesus to death. And yet later on, as he's going uh, to, to arrest Christians, and, and, and he is becoming this thorn to the church, this danger and threat to the people of God, what happens along the road to Damascus is that he meets the risen Jesus Christ and he, he falls at his feet and he calls him Lord and he uh, trusts him as his saviour and he no longer persecutes the church, but he preaches the gospel. He becomes one of the greatest preachers that the, the church has ever seen, writing nearly half of the New Testament that we have in our Bibles now. The, what, 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 how do you explain Paul if he was not really someone who had seen Jesus risen from the dead? How do you explain the disciples who had been cowards hiding in the upper room, who scattered when Jesus was arrested? How do you explain the disciples becoming brave men and going out into the world and, and being described as those who turned the world upside down, all of whom except one was put to death for declaring Jesus risen from the dead? How do you explain that? If they knew it wasn't true, how do you explain someone being willing not to kill for a lie, but to die for a lie? Well, here's the explanation. It wasn't a lie. It was true. They had seen Jesus with their own eyes. They had eaten with him, risen from the dead. And, and the persecutor Paul, his life was changed because he knew Christ lived I wonder, do you believe the facts of the resurrection as witnessed by the prophets and the apostles? The gospel we have received is, uh, it, from the apostles is grounded not in fantasy, but in historical fact. Christian, let that sink in. It, it, the resurrection is not a fairy tale. The resurrection is not a myth. The resurrection is a historical fact. It, it has eyewitnesses that attested to it. It was this fact that caused 11 fearful men to turn the world upside down. It was this fact that turned a persecutor of the church to become its greatest missionary. And it is still this fact today that causes the unbeliever to change their mind and follow Jesus Christ. And if you haven't yet, I urge you to look into the biblical evidence for Christ's death and resurrection. That's the confidence of Christ's resurrection. But secondly, I want us now to consider the consequences of Christ's resurrection. This is verses 12 to 34. And so, in other words, what, why does it matter? Why does it matter if Christ did rise from the dead? After all, Lazarus was raised from the dead. But we're not here talking about Lazarus. We're here talking about Jesus. So why does that matter? Well, the resurrection of Jesus is has had far greater consequences. And uh, the, its consequences are seen even for us today. You see, yet there were some people in Corinth who, who claimed there was no resurrection. But, but Paul refutes this entire idea, and in the process of refuting it, he shows us what the resurrection has achieved. Now, um, full disclosure, what Paul has said here, he puts in the negative but I'm turning it around and putting it in the positive so we're clear on what the consequences of Christ's resurrection are. But you will find each of these in the text, okay, just for those who are concerned that you might not. 
Okay, so here's, here's the first consequence of Christ's resurrection. We have forgiveness for the past. We have forgiveness for the past. I remember speaking to a man who had been in prison, a very young man, and he had told me uh, with great enthusiasm about how his whole life had been reformed while he was in prison. He had uh, really applied himself to uh, really change his ways, and since being released and working with his probation officer, he was doing really well. He had found himself a job. He had reformed his character, and, and I was really pleased to hear that. That's really, really good. And then he made an admission. He said, that is all great, but when I think about my past, I just can't get rid of the guilt. I just can't get rid of the guilt. It, he said, it keeps me up at night. And he says, I've changed my way of living, and I'm not involved in what I once was involved. But how do I get rid of this guilt? Here's the answer. A saviour. A saviour who is able to wash away your sins. A saviour who is able to guarantee forgiveness from God, our judge. A saviour who is able to deal with the heart of a person and not simply the outward behaviour of a person. See, we have forgiveness for the past. Uh, Once a year... The high priest in the Old Testament uh, would enter the most holy part of the temple in Jerusalem, and he would bring a sacrifice of an animal and the blood, and he would sprinkle the blood around this most holy part of the temple where God's presence was, was, was there. And the only way the people knew the sacrifice for their sin had been accepted was when he reappeared. How do we know that Jesus Christ on the cross really made a sacrifice for our sins that was accepted by a holy God? It was not that we would not, if he was in the tomb, we would not be sure. We would have no confidence. But Paul says, It is the resurrection, it is the reappearance of Jesus Christ from the tomb that makes us certain that the words Jesus said on the cross were not empty words when he cried out, it is finished. It's paid. He's paid it all. If he hadn't, he wouldn't have been able to rise again from the dead. If he hadn't, he would still be in the grave. And if he was still in the grave, Paul says, you would still be in your sins. Your faith is futile. That's literally what he says, isn't it? In in verses, um, in verse, uh, uh, verses 12 to 19. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are, even to be found, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Because like that high priest, he, if he doesn't reappear, the sacrifice is unacceptable. There's no forgiveness. There's no acceptableness in in God's presence. There's no uh, forgiveness for the past. There's no washing of your sins. There's no guilt for the the sins that you've done in in the old life uh, at all. No, uh, but then what does he say? But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, you are destined for hell. That's what Paul says. But then the second consequence is this. 
of Christ rising from the dead is not only forgiveness for the past, but we have hope for the future. Verses 20 to 28, we have hope for the future. Uh, He says uh, that Christ is the first fruits, verse 20, of those who have fallen asleep. Now, perhaps uh, for a, 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 um, a community that is, is not based in uh, the, the rural life, um, we're, we're more urbanized, um, we perhaps read fir- first fruits and we kind of just gloss over it and we're not really sure what that's about. But in Israelite life, the first fruits was a very important part of the year. Because as, they, as an agricultural community, as they would plant uh, uh, their seeds and they would wait for it to grow and produce fruit, they were required to take the first of that fruit, the first fruit that appeared, and they were to take it and they were to offer it to God in thanksgiving for all that he had given to them, for his blessings. They were to wave it before his presence. And in the same way, Paul says, Christ is the first fruit from the dead because they were giving thanks, but they were also saying, we believe God is going to continue to provide more fruit. We give this because we believe God is a provider. And when Christ was risen from the dead, it is to say, it is God's way of saying to his people, there's more to come. There's more to come. That death for the believer is not the end. But his resurrection is the confirmation that those who believe in him today will rise with him from the dead when he comes in his glory with his heavenly angels by his side. When when in the final judgment, uh, he he raises the dead to life, Uh, his people will be with him for all of eternity. That is, uh, because Christ is risen, you don't need to fear the grave. Because Christ is risen, you can know, believer, that death is not the end. When your body is put in the ground, it is put in the ground with the hope, that the certain hope, the sure hope, not a wishy-washy hope, not a hope like, you know, I, I hope I might... Um, I, I hope that, you know, I might get some dinner later on and I hope the dinner doesn't burn. This is a hope that is certain. This is a hope that's guaranteed. What's the guarantee? Christ is risen. And if Christ is risen, will he let those who have believed in him, those who he has died for, stay in the grave for eternity? Of course he won't. He will raise them from the dead, uh, as as he did to Lazarus standing at his tomb. Uh, When he comes to to judge the world, he he will raise his people to life. He will not allow the grave to have the victory. Believer, what sort of person will you be Knowing that death is not the end of the story. Knowing that death has no grip on you. Knowing that death is no longer a permanent state. So uh, he changed the terms. I've said this before. I'm moving this. I've said this before. Because this is just... You just don't look happy enough about it. I've just got to say it. This This is just tremendously good news. This is... This alters everything, doesn't it? That that here is a man raised from the dead on the third day. He didn't swoon on the cross. He didn't faint on the cross. He wouldn't have survived the grave if he did. And the Romans were expert killers. And And as they place him in a tomb, it was only a borrowed tomb, because God knew what was going to happen next. It was the tomb was going to get given back because it was redundant. It wasn't required after the third day. Jesus rose from it. The stone was rolled away. The angels announced he is risen. He's not here. Don't look for the living among the dead. And brothers and sisters, because he lives, the terms and conditions of death have changed forever. Death is not a permanent condition. Do you notice when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he doesn't say the believers are dead? He says they've fallen asleep. Now, I, I, I was at a wedding yesterday. Thank you very much for your prayers. It went really well. Um, but I was at a wedding yesterday, and it was in Hereford. Um, I left a little bit early, 
uh, after having dinner. Um, and then as I came back, uh, it was very late, and I went to sleep. And when I went to sleep, do you know what I was expecting? It's, it's an obvious question. Do you know what I was expecting? To, to wake up again. To wake up again. Because that's what we do when we sleep. That's what we hope to do when we sleep. We go to bed expecting that next morning we're going to wake up and we're going to get out of bed and we're going to go about our business of the day. How fitting that the Christian, uh, the, the, the apostles and disciples after Jesus had risen from the dead decided we're changing the name of it. We're going to do what Jesus did when he said about Lazarus, when the disciples received news that Lazarus had died, and Jesus said, uh, he, he hasn't died, he's, he's just sleeping. We're going to wake him up. And, and so the disciples took that. They took that term, and they began to use it in their writings, describing Christians who have died as fallen asleep, because they know that though they have uh, ceased to be among us, it is only for a short time. It is only for a little while. And in the end, they will be triumphantly and gloriously raised from that grave where they lie and be given new bodies. We're going to think about that a little bit more this afternoon. But there's our hope, a hope for the future. Who else can give you hope like that? Here is um, Gandhi. Can Gandhi give you hope like that? Gandhi who was born, who lived, who died. Where's Gandhi today? Still in the grave. Dead. Can Muhammad give you hope like that? Muhammad who, he, he was born, he lived, he died. Where's Muhammad today? Still dead. You can actually go and visit his bones in Mecca. He's dead. We, we could go on, couldn't we? we? We could list others. Jesus Christ. He was born. He lived. He died. He rose again. He lives forevermore. By faith in him, your past sins are forgiven. Your future hope is secured. Why would you back anyone else? Why would you not trust a man who can rise from the dead? Why would your faith be in anything else than him and him alone? Well, there's a third thing. You see, we not only have forgiveness for the past and hope for the future, we have power to live in the present. Verses 29 uh, to 34 are quite tricky, actually. And you might, if you, read, if you read through 1 Corinthians 15 this week, you might be wondering what Steve's going to say about this. Paul says, uh, speaking, making his argument, making his case that Jesus is risen from the dead, he says, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are the people baptized on their behalf? And so we go, what's that about? That's a strange verse, isn't it? Um, does this, is this Paul instructing us to be baptized on the dead, for, on behalf of the dead who have not been baptized? No. There is, and and why, why do I know? Well, because uh, there, we, we need to make sure that we are, are interpreting Scripture with Scripture. We don't find this as a command anywhere else in Scripture. This is the only reference in the entire Bible to being baptised on behalf of the dead. So let's not make a doctrine out of a single verse. But what, how else do we, not, do we know it's not a, uh, a, a, a command for, for uh, something that we should be copying and imitating as, as a church? Well, because uh, Paul doesn't commend it. Paul doesn't instruct that we should do it. In fact, um, Paul doesn't even say, what do we mean by baptizing, uh, by being baptized on behalf of the dead? He says, what do people mean? 
He is making a statement that in Corinth at the time, there were Christians who were baptizing other people on behalf of the dead. We need to ask why. Why were they doing that? Uh, I don't believe they were right to do it. I don't think Paul isn't commending them for it. He's not saying, well done. He's just stating that's what you do. And he's making his argument. His main point is the, the, the dead, uh, the, there is a resurrection from the dead. And so he's carrying on his argument. He's not going to get distracted. And, and so why it, might it be that Christians, I believe in error, were baptizing people on behalf of the dead? Well, verse 30, and the rest may give us a hint. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus if the dead are not raised? Now, what's that about? You see, there is intense persecution happening in the Roman world against Christians at this time. And it is likely that the Corinthian Christians are experiencing other Christians within their own church being arrested and being taken to fight with beasts for, for, for entertainment of Rome. And so the, you have these Christians who are dying for their faith before they even have opportunity to be baptised. And so, uh, so what Paul is actually speaking about here is he's speaking about, here, here we are, we are uh, the, the resurrection changes the way you live in the present. He, say, he turns it to himself. He says, uh, what do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus if the dead are not raised? And then look what he says. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And so he's saying, he's saying, what is the point in, in, in living this life if the, uh, for Christ? What is the point in dying for Christ if the dead do not rise? But he says, look, your persecution is not empty. You, it, do, as you look at the resurrection, as you remind yourself of the reality of Christ's resurrection, you can have power to know that the way you are living as you live for him is not futile, it is not purposeless, you don't give up and go away and live your old life and let's eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die, live with purpose, live to serve God, live knowing that your work, as he will conclude in chapter 15, uh, your, that your work for the Lord is not in vain, it's not empty, it's not for nothing, even if you were to be put to death, you see, the resurrection motivates the Christian to live a transformed life. Oh, brothers and sisters, e anyone here, in the light of the resurrection, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Live for him boldly, confidently, urgently. It be, death itself will not hold you. So live as though death itself has no power over you. What sort of boldness might we see? What sort of energy in the church might we uh, witness if Christians could think just more and more on the resurrection of Jesus Christ? What, what unashamed lives we would live for the sake of Jesus knowing that the mock, mockery of the world and the persecution of those who might be described as our enemies is, is not able uh, to take our hope from us. Oh, have you received the benefits of Christ's resurrection? The forgiveness of sins? Are your sins forgiven? Do you have hope? A hope that goes beyond the grave? And are you living a transformed life in the light of his resurrection? It is not enough to merely believe the fact that Christ rose from the dead. You must believe in him who rose from the dead. He is the one who gives forgiveness. He is the one who gives hope. 
He is the one who rescues from sin, death, and hell. So how do we finish? Well, because Christ is risen, do not be deceived by anyone who says there is no judgment after death. Do not be deceived by any teaching that says this is all there is in this life. This is all there is. They're lying. They don't know. Christ is risen. Death is not the end. And because Jesus is risen, do not go on in your old sinful ways. Live to sin no more. But what does Paul say? Wake up. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. Jesus is risen Through faith in him, wake up, be saved, live in the power of his resurrection. And then come back this evening and see, or this afternoon, and see what this means for our future in a bit more detail.